Thank you very much. My name is Steve Shalkin uh, from, from the North America. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about pre-operative planning. Now, please don't go to sleep because this is probably the single most important lecture that you're going to have after Fred's, of course. And you're going to be able to take this information home with you today, put it into application, and reduce the morbidity and mortality of your surgical cases. And I'll show you how this is going to happen. I propose to you that preoperative planning can make you a better surgeon. I would propose that it can improve patient safety. I would propose that it can reduce morbidity and mortality, and I'll show you some figures on this. And it can improve your surgical outcomes. Now, these are some pretty widely uh, uh, wide statements that are hard to substantiate. So my objective today is to convince you in this course that you, you should plan all of your operations. And I'd like to describe a four-step approach to preoperative planning. Now, most people can remember four things, and they're very easy. They go in sequence. And it's, the, it's what I call a preoperative workflow. So that's what we're going to develop today. I'm going to discuss some mechanisms to improve the communications that are very important in preoperative planning. And I'd like you to recognize and accept the importance of preoperative checklists. Now, the aviation industry has been the leader in planning for many, many years. It started back in 1935 at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, when this aircraft, it's a B-17, something called the Flying Fortress, was taking a maiden cruise. It climbed to 1,600 feet, took a hard left turn, and crashed, killing two of the five people on board. This was a complex aircraft. It was relatively new. It had retractable landing gears. It had retractable flaps, variable pitch propellers. There was a lot of work to be done in that cockpit. The crashed investigators at that time decided that the cause of the crash was simply that the pilot forgot to remove the gust lock. It's a simple cotter pin that goes through the yoke that controls the airplane. He forgot to do it, and the plane crashed. And they determined that because of the complex aircraft systems, that this aircraft required too much information for one pilot to remember at one time. So as a result of this, they developed pilot checklists. And the preoperative planning, or the pre-flight planning, began at this time. And this has become the standard in the aviation industry. And the Federal Aviation Commission mandates that every aircraft have pilot checklists and preoperative planning in it at that time. The, the preoperative planning consists of four steps. I told you you could remember four things. They plan the flight, how to get from point A to point B. They file a flight plan with the Federal Aviation Administration, and this is done worldwide. They check the equipment and instruments in their plane. Because once you get aloft, you don't have a chance to find out if your wheels have adequate air. And they communicate with air traffic control all the way. And they have checklists for just about every aspect of a flight. Startup, pre-flight, taxi, all these things are as a checklist to keep you from forgetting one of the vital steps. Now, in the aviation industry, the goal is aircraft safety and passenger, aircraft and passenger safety. Very, very simple. And when I was in flight training, my flight instructor would teach me, plan your flight and fly your plan. Keep this in mind, please. I would propose to you that there is a very analogous orthopedic model to this pre-flight planning and we call it preoperative planning. And there just happens to be four steps involved in preoperative planning. You plan your operation. You start by studying your x-rays, deciding how you're going to go about doing this, understanding the injuries. Then you outline your surgical tactic. This is your step-by-step -step surgical approach. Then you request your equipment and instruments from the operating room. They have to know what you need for this operation. 
and then you communicate with the operating room team. And if you think of it in this way, and think of these four steps, this is part of the preoperative planning. And now we've added this preoperative timeout and checklist, which I think are critically important. Now, this doesn't cost anything. You can make them in your computer at home. Your hospital may have some. This preoperative checklist is the single most important thing you can do to reduce your morbidity and mortality. Now, there are many advantages to preoperative planning. I've listed a whole bunch here, but more importantly, it helps you understand your fracture. It helps you prepare yourself for the operating room. And just as importantly, it helps to allow your surgical team to prepare themselves for the operating room. It improves patient safety, and I'll show you some data on this. It eliminates, eliminates the risk of wrong side, wrong site, and wrong patient surgery. This still happens and it will reduce morbidity and mortality. I've said that two or three times. I'm hoping to convince you that that really works. The goal of orthopedic planning, very similar to that of the aviation industry, is improved surgical outcomes and improved patient safety. That's what we're all here for. It's all about the patient. But this is best done with a team approach, and you have to be the leader of the team. I am giving you permission, I'm empowering every one of you in this room to be the leader in your operating room. And I would propose to you that when you get in the operating room, you remember to plan your operation and operate your plan. Now who is, hold the hands of the, people, the group that is responsible for the take home message today, this morning. Some of you have been, have you done it, yes? Okay. Should. I am giving you a take-home message that you may want to consider. And, uh, and, and if you remember this, plan your operation, operate your plan. Every time you do an operation, you're going to think of this course, and you're going to think of your chairpersons and your faculty, and you remember this time in Davos, and you're going to remember to plan your operation and operate your plan. Let's take this one step at a time very briefly. Planning the operation allows you to critically study the radiographs, it allows you to understand the injury. We normally have been teaching uh, preoperative planning for 51 years in the AO. My personal feeling is we've been doing a very inadequate job. We focus on this templating business. And I'll show you how we'll do it. And you, in fact, will do this in your practical exercise today. So you trace the outline of the normal bone, trace the outline of the fracture fragments, overlay the fragments, that's why it's called the overlay technique, and then you overlay the implants. We'll take this one step at a time. You start with good quality ortho or orthogonal x-rays, good AP and lateral x-rays. You can't do these without good x-rays. The first step is to trace the outline of the normal bone so that you have an outline. If this serves as your template to produce your alignment, you have to know where you're going with this. And it, it helps when you trace this out that you separate the bone so there's no overlap. No one says they have to be side by side, as you'll see. So trace them out, separate them out so you can see a good AP, good lateral. Step one, we have three more to go. Step two is do you trace the fracture. This is on a second piece of paper. You trace the fracture fragments uh, on a separate piece and separate them out so there's no overlap so you can see them. It helps to separate them all out. So the goal here is to identify each fracture fragment. We said to understand the bony injury. Now, thirdly, you simply overlay your fracture fragments on the normal bone. And what happens, you end up, and you draw these in positions, and you end up with an a outline of a normal bone with the fracture lines in place. So you know how it should do, look when it's reduced. Fourthly, then you overlay your implants on this reduced fracture, and then you determine, that will help you determine the size of the implant, the position of the implant, the screw placement, the sequence of screw placements, which you have to think about, and the finished product will be a reduced fracture with the implants in place that are sized and positioned. It's very simple. This is the templating portion. 
This is, this is only one phase of the preoperative planning. And as I said, you will do this. Now, first one I said is understand the injury. The second one is outline the surgical tactic. And this allows you to sit down, look at your reduction, and plan your operation. This is your mental step-by-step -step uh, operating uh, walk through the operation. And you want to consider everything you're going to do. I actually write it, write it out on my paper so that I know what I'm going to do. It forces me to think of this. And if I get to a decision point, I have, I have a plan A, plan B. So you may want to consider the patient position, surgical approach, pertinent anatomy, any of the reduction techniques that Fred just talked to you. How are you going to reduce this bone? And implant placement. You can be as detailed as you need to. But think it through first. Step three. Now you've got, you know what you want to do. You have to tell your operating room what you're going to do. You have to request your instruments and implants. Now, in my opinion, the standard surgical preference cards do not work well with trauma because you have so many different types of bones, so many different sets, so many different types of fractures. They are not all the same. An ankle fracture is not an ankle fracture is not an ankle fracture. You may need different sets. So I recommend the use of a checklist or a list to record your surgical instrument. And this prepares you and your operating team for the case. It assures that your operating team can make sure that you have adequate implants in the operating room. And any special needs like C-arms, cell savers, you want to make sure that those are there in advance. So when you get in the operating room, this is, this is an example of the checklist that I developed back in 1991. It's a complex, but these are every instrument set that my hospital has for my fracture surgery. I know it's in every set. I simply take a highlighting pen, starting with position, special instruments, power tools, and every instrument I want. But when you're done, there's just a few things checked. I give this to the operating room, and they know exactly what I want. I say, pull what I ask you to pull, and don't pull anything else. If I don't ask for it, don't pull it out. And finally, you give this to your operating team. I emphasize team. So don't assume anything in the operating room because they can't read your mind. You have to tell them what you want and what you need. Your operating room is your place of business, and you have to be in control. You have to take charge because you are the primary advocate for your patient, and you want things to go well. This type of approach promotes teamwork and it improves communication within the operating room and it establishes leadership roles in the operating room. I used to think, and I, I'm from a Navy background, and we used to say that the surgeon is the captain of the ship. And that's the ultimate authority. I've changed my mind about that. I like to think of the surgeon as the leader of the team. That you don't have ultimate authority, you have two eyes and two hands. You can't do everything. You want to bring in the help of all of your team. But you don't want to give them the, the attitude that you can't talk to me because I've made up my mind and nothing you say is going to help. Because you need their help. And you want to have an open communication with them. Allow them to say, Dr. Shelkin, uh, we, we, we're missing a sponge. Um, uh, it looks to me from this direction like this reduction could be a little bit better. Uh, they'll help you if you let them and ask them. But be open to that. It's critically important. And you'll have happy campers in there. They love this. So in 2001, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeon came out in a position statement on wrong side surgery. And they said, I highlighted it, that wrong site surgery results from poor preoperative planning and a simple mistake in communications. That's exactly what we've been talking about this morning. This can be eliminated entirely. One of the methods to do this, and there are several simple methods that can be used that you should consider in your operative plan, is the sign your site. This was started by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons in my region in 2001. You simply have the surgeon go into the pre-op area while the patient's awake, agree on what shoulder you're going to operate on it, take a marking pen, write your initials on it. There's no question to, in the mind of your patient 
or yourself or your team what you're doing. In addition, other things have come out. In my region, it was through the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Health Maintenance Organizations, something called a Universal Protocol. And they had four steps. Preoperative verification process, mark the preoperative site, and then this timeout before surgery. The timeout so you don't forget to remove that gust lock from the yoke on your airplane and cause things to crash. And use of surgical checklists. Let me show you my checklist. This is a simple, this is a piece of paper. I did this on my computer. I laminated it on a, on a uh, clipboard. And just before I get ready to leave the room to scrub, I give the universal American football sign for timeout. Every member of my team is in the operating room and has a job. The anesthesia person reads the name of the patient off of the band. It has to match what's on the chart. I stand at the foot and go through this checklist. There's 19 items. You can read them. Does the patient have any allergies? Are their pressure points padded? Are your x-rays up? Are they turned correctly? Is it, are they the right x-rays? And are your lights set? All this should be done before you leave the room. This checklist takes me 20 seconds out of my life, and it can make a difference. Of course, you get down to the most important things, who's in charge of the music, and then we go scrub. Now, I told you I'd show you some data on this. This is relatively recent, less than a year. New England Journal of Medicine, January 29th, 2009. A it's called the safety checklist to reduce morbidity and mortality in a global population. A simple uh, procedure. Eight hospitals, eight countries. These are not third world countries. We had some in North America, some in Manila, all around the world. Good hospitals. They simply used the World Health Organization surgical checklist. And that's the only thing they changed. Use it before they did script. They reduced morbidity and mortality by 36%. Now that's astonishing that we can improve morbidity and mortality so much. The concerning point is what in the world have we been doing in the past that allows us to have 36% mortality and morbidity? A simple piece of paper checklist that costs almost nothing and it's simply a procedure that you can do and you have charge of this in the operating room can change, reduce your morbidity and mortality. And I highly recommend that if you're not doing this and your hospital has not adopted this, that it should be done. This is the World Health Organization checklist. You can make your own. This has 19 check marks from sign in to time out to sign out. It's very simple. It comes in about eight languages. You can get this on the World Health Organization website. You may want to use this to adopt your own. And finally, I ask you as surgeons, as we do in all of our AO courses, to self-assess. At the end of every operation, you have your preoperative x-rays, you have your preoperative plan. Put that side to side with your post-operative x-rays and evaluate them critically. And you ask yourself two questions. What went well with this operation? Because you definitely want to do that next time. And secondly, what could I do different next time to make the, the operation better or safer for the patient? And I guarantee that if you ask yourself this every time before you leave the room, this is your treat to yourself for introspection, self-evaluation. And if you could impl implement these changes the next time, you will be a better surgeon. And that's what we're here to do, be better surgeons for our patients. So in summary, Preoperative planning is good for you. Preoperative planning is good for your patients. It's very good for your operating room team. It yields better patient outcomes. It makes you a better surgeon. It reduces morbidity and mortality. And the mantra that we used to have in the AO was failing to plan is planning to fail. But I would propose to you that you will remember in the future to plan your operation and operate your plan. Thank you very much.